Okay, um, next section, meta properties. So I have to acknowledge that we've we started it pretty basic. Um, we've gotten incredibly detailed, but now we're really, 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 really going to get complex, right? And um, a series like this and videos like this, the whole reason why I'm I'm doing this is to share sort of this is the way in which I attained my sort of expert analysis, right, my ability, and I'm not trying to just, you know, it's not a bragging point, but it's, it's, it's for you to be able to arrive at the assessment and analysis of extremely complex relationships and to be able to make assessments of data that seems to be completely non-related requires that you formalize, it doesn't have to be my heuristic model, but formalize your own heuristic model. I think my, models, my model works perfectly for analyzing data um, and very complex data. But to be honest with you, the level that we've done so far are only talking about properties. A group alpha has properties P1 through P4. You can have an analysis that's even deeper than that and it's known as meta property. So what we're going to do is talk about meta property analysis. Now this is this is we're at like graduate level now, right? This is not some high school level analysis unless you're like super smart in high school. I'm sure there's a handful of high school students that will be able to get this. And if you're a high school student watching this and you get it, shout out to you, right? That's pretty hardcore because I would have been lost if I was in high school. Right? I hope high school students are watching this. This would be cool. that would be an achievement. So we're not just going to talk about properties now. We're going to talk about properties of properties, right? For those of you who know um, John Locke, we know that Locke talks about um, primary and secondary qualities, properties and qualities, same idea, right? You can talk about meta property analysis, right? Properties of properties. So this is much, much deeper than before. Okay, so let's do meta property analysis. Much deeper discussion, same concept. The basic pattern, analogical relationship, A is like B. Recognize that A is like B, positive analogical relation, they share properties. Negative analogical relation, they do not share properties. Neutral analogical relationship, they may or may not share properties. We recognize that with the, what we just recognized, which was pretty difficult to get to, I had to check myself, but we recognize that with the decrease, if we're talking about adaptability, and we define adaptability in terms of an increase in shared analogical relations, I'll say that again slowly, if we define adaptability as an increase in shared analogical relationships, then there is an inverse relationship between um, negative properties and adaptability. As negative properties decrease, as negative properties decrease, then we recognize, well, they, there's no longer, um, there's no longer, a sh and this is what we said in number three, right? There's no longer a shared property. Well, um, adaptability increases, right? As negative properties decrease, adaptability increases. Now, obviously, that could be manipulated a bit if we substitute the assumption there, which I didn't discuss earlier because I don't want to get too deep, is that we substitute um, the property with a corresponding property. If we substitute it with a different property, well, it might not change the nature, but I'm not going to complicate the analysis. It's just to get you to think critically. So we recognize that um, what we can talk about are the relationships now of not just the properties, alphas, properties a, uh, P1 through P4, in relationship to betas, properties P1 through P4, but we can talk about properties of properties, and what might that look like, right? So, um, on meta properties on page five, what we're going to recognize is that we've broken this down, I've broken this down into quadrants, right? This is quadrant one, this is quadrant two, this is quadrant three, this is quadrant four, right? So we've broken this down into quadrants, one, two, three, four. Okay.
this is gamma, this is uh, delta. Okay, so we'll populate gamma with all P1s. This is just for example so that you understand. And we'll populate uh, delta with random property generator P3, P1, and P1. Okay, so that's what I have. Okay, now let's look at this. Remember, we're talking about meta properties now, right? So, quadrant location, the location of the upper, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, quadrant location is a primary property of the group. This primary property is fixed, it's inherent within the group, where a property is applied is contingent on the existence of that location, so that the location itself becomes a property, right? This quadrant becomes a property. It becomes a primary property, right? It's inherent. It's fixed. I can have put P1 here through P4 or a random property generator in this. I can put, there's a lot of flexibility with what I can put here, but this location is fixed. It's inherent within the structure of the group alpha or the group delta, right? So that we can talk, I haven't done this before, right? And I specifically designed a lecture such that when I initially pre presented the information, I just said, you know, uh, delta has property P1, um, uh, uh, gamma has property P1, delta has property P1, and that was fine. But you can be more specific, right? You can talk about meta properties. You can say, and I'll talk about it in a second. I want to jump ahead. So the quadrant itself is property, right? The location is itself a property. That's what I'm saying here. This applies to many, many things. I use this example right beneath the example of this concept. I still to this point, I haven't, I have never seen this on the internet, and I'm gonna keep right here on my desk. I've never seen it on the internet at all, right? Um, and I was, and I'm not making this up because I have the video link and you can watch the video, just to show you that what I'm doing is not something that I'm pulling out of the thin air. I um, used exactly what I'm teaching you right now. I used exactly the method that I'm teaching you right now coupled with uh, some more advanced techniques that I'm not going to teach, uh, at least not yet, I might maybe later in the critical thinking series, to develop a bona fide new way of solving the Rubik's Cube, right? And I've clicked the link, I used a heuristic model with respect to exactly this quadrant system, a more profound quadrant system, but exactly the same format of this quadrant system to develop a new way to solve this cube. Why? Because I recognize that the location of the cube, the location of each piece is itself a property, that the location of each piece on this cube is itself a property, but it's an inherent property, as I said in the notes, right? It's an inherent property. Quadrant location is a primary property of the group. It's fixed, it's inherent. So that the fact that this piece is in this location is inherent. What's flexible is the fact that green is here and white is here. It could be the case that white is here and green is here. So I took that assessment and I realized that everyone who was talking about the algorithms, I'm not going to get into the, this is not a cube video, but this is a great example, everyone who's talking about the algorithms to solve the Rubik's Cube misconstrued that the algorithms apply to what I would call secondary properties of the cube being the color. It doesn't apply to secondary properties of the cube. It applies to primary properties being the quadrant location. So what I was able to do, and I demonstrate this, and you can watch the video as proof, uh, and it's something that I developed myself, was I was able to entirely solve the Rubik's Cube using this exact heuristic modeling method. So think about what I've done on just, and it's not a huge accomplishment. I'm not looking for accolades. I'm not looking for praise. What it does is shows, it serves as sort of verification that this is not hokey, like this works, right? I used a, a much more complicated heuristic modeling for the Rubik's Cube to to help me solve the Rubik's Cube using algorithms that were already out there. Because I recognized, and I want you to recognize, that we can talk about properties on properties. You can go properties on properties and properties and properties, you can complicate it a lot. But with respect to the cube, it's, it functions exactly the same because we have two properties. The inherency of the piece in this particular location cannot be changed. You can't pull this piece out and put this piece over here. This piece is here as a property of the cube. The fact that red is on the top and yellow is on the side is, 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 is not inherent, I can put yellow, and I'll just do it just to show you I'm not going to solve the cube. I can put